Good morning. And a very warm welcome to the worship of God. Good to see you all here. As usual, tea and coffee through in the hall after the service. Do join us for a time of fellowship there if you can. And just a reminder that at the end of the service, if you wish to have prayer for yourself um, in response to what you've been hearing, what God's been saying to you, then just come forward to the organ here quietly, uh, and Joe will be there uh, to pray with you if you wish. This afternoon at three o'clock up at Meadshaw, we have uh, uh, the Robertson Connect group, previously called Discipleship Explored, a bit like X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, Connect, formerly known as Discipleship Explorer. It's the same in every other way, but change the name to make it the same as other groups, uh, one up in uh, Sunny Hill. Uh, so it's a positive development. So all are welcome to that, even if you've not been before. Three o'clock up at Meadshaw towards Craig. The magazines are available uh, for Uplift by Distributors today. Thanks to Joe and the team for getting that ready. Prayer meeting, seven o'clock on Thursday, on Zoom, ask me for the link for that if you wish. And next Sunday, just a reminder that it's the first Sunday of the month, 4th of February, so it's our United service, and it's 10.30 here at Teviot. And then we have the Cafe Style service at six o'clock. I've been looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit through in the hall there. Is Ron Smith here? No. I was going to thank him <laughs> because at the end of this month, the beginning of February, Ron is stepping down as treasurer and uh, Andy Mayberry is going to be taking over and we're very grateful to Ron for his 23 plus years of service as treasurer, for all he's done, for all the hard work involved in being treasurer. Uh, so we can silently, we're going, to, we're going to give him a round of applause, but since he's not here, we'll just thank him. If he's watching online, he'll be recorded, watching this in a recorded fashion afterwards, he'll hear our thanks. Uh, and Andy, can we show our appreciation to Andy for taking over, and our prayers are with him, and uh, we look forward to how God will use his gifts in, in this particular role, along with all the other things he does. So can we show our appreciation to Andy for taking over? Thank you. Let us worship God. We're going to say together um, some words from Psalm 95, the first part of Psalm 95. Let's say these words together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Amen. So let's sing together now, as the deer pants for the water will stand to sing, based in part on Psalm 42.
Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we come together to bow down and worship before you, to thank you, to sing for joy to you. For you are God, our God, the one true and living God who created us and who made us to be your very own through Jesus Christ, your Son. We love you, Lord, and we worship you. Lord, we long, like the psalmist, to know you more deeply. We thirst for you like the deer pants for water. We need you, Lord, and we love you. And we yearn to experience more of you in your reality, love, and power, to trust in you and rest in you. We do trust you, Lord. Our hope is in you. And we seek to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Come, Lord, and do us good today, we pray, as we look to you. We confess our sin, our lack of trust in you, our reluctance to obey you, our coldness of heart, our putting other things in your place. Whatever it may be, may we, as you have promised, know your forgiveness and cleansing as we confess our sins. Lord God, our Father, send forth your word, your, your truth, your light, your Holy Spirit. Let them guide us to you. Give us ears to hear and hearts to trust, love, and obey. Even when things are hard to understand and perplexing, we trust you, Lord. Direct us in our worship now, Lord, we pray. Direct us to yourself. You are our joy and our delight. And may we praise you with all we are and have. We bring all our prayers in Jesus' name. We continue in the words, the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mary is now going to bring us our Bible today. The reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 9, verses 12 to 21. That's page 1239 at the bottom of it to 1240 in your Bible. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that's before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound in, at the great river Euphrates and the four angels who have been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouth came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the ho horses was in their mouths and in their tails for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons 
and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Amen. Thank you, Mary, for reading for us. Sing again now. Oh, for a closer walk with God. Stuart Townend's modern version of this hymn. Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road leading to the land. Where is that blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is that so refreshing view of Jesus and His Word? Oh, fire of God, come burn in me. Renew a holy passion till Christ my deepest longing be, my never failing fountain. My never failing fountain. What peaceful hours I once enjoyed. How sweet the memory still. But they have left an aching void. The world can never fill. Oh, fire of God, come burn in me. Renew a holy passion. Till Christ my deepest longing be. My never failing fountain. My never failing fountain. only thee so shall my walk be close with God serene my frame so pure a light shall mark the road that leads me to the land oh fire of God come burn in me renew a hope Till Christ my deepest longing be My never failing fountain Oh fire of God come burn in me Renew a holy passion Till Christ my deepest longing be My never failing fountain my never failing fountain. Let us pray. Lord, as we come uh, to your word now, this uh, challenging portion of your word. Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts through it. Take my weak words and speak your perfect word, your word of power to our hearts and for your purposes. Amen. So we're listening to these seven trumpets sounding 
in this part of the uh, vision that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle John, this revelation, the last book of the New Testament. These trumpets are solemn, they're warnings, they're sobering. They come as a giant corrective to our thinking and perspective, don't they? Which uh, is so easily, even subconsciously, shaped by the godless, secular context in which we live. So we need to hear it. We need to hear this truth from the Lord, however uncomfortable it may be for us to hear it. So we turn to the sixth trumpet this morning. It's introduced also as a second woe, verse 12 said, well, it was the previous bit, wasn't it? It said that the eagle flying in heaven. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, those who live without reference to God, because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. And then the first verse of our reading today, the first woe is past, two other woes are yet to come, and this is the second one. There are similarities here with the fifth trumpet, but what we see here is that there is an intensification of suffering with the sounding of this trumpet. So we've got three headings today, and the first is the judgment of death, verses 13 to 16. When the fifth trumpet sounded, remember a star fell to earth we saw was the devil, and acting under the sovereign authority of God, the devil released an army of locusts from hell, really, who brought about torment on those who did not have the seal of God on their forehead. That is, those who are not believers in Christ, who don't know that security. This torment was partial. Torment was partial, like the judgments brought about throughout the series of trumpets. It lasted five months. A strange time, but note that it is less than half a year. So it's like the third. It's not a majority, but a large number, a large minority. Remember, a third of the sea and the land and so on were damaged before in the earlier trumpets. And the, the, the aim of these trumpets, as before, is to bring people back to God. What happens when the sixth trumpet sounds is even more serious than the fifth. John in his vision hears a voice coming from the horns of the altar, the golden altar before God in heaven. We saw this altar back in when the seals were being opened. The fifth seal was opened. And under this golden altar before God in the heavenly throne room, in the temple there, whatever the heavenly place is, the souls of those who had died for their faith, Christians who had died because of their allegiance to Christ, were crying out to God for justice. Then that altar reappears at the end of chapter, beginning of chapter 8, when on that altar an angel offers up the prayers of all God's people, including the prayers of these martyrs, with incense, and then he takes fire from the altar and throws it on the earth, a sign of God's judgment in response to the prayers of God's people. So that was that altar, and it reappears now. When the sixth trumpet sounds, a voice comes from the four horns of this altar, the projections at the four corners of the square altar, the horns. In the Old Testament, people used to go and grab hold of these horns, seeking refuge when they'd sinned and so on. It's presumably the voice of God. This voice we're not told. And the voice tells the sixth angel, who has the trumpet ready to sound it, who has just sounded his trumpet rather, tells him to release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Again, bound angels, that means that they're fallen angels. They have been bound because of their sin, but they're released now, demons, from the river Euphrates. At times in the Old Testament, the Euphrates, it's 
east of the promised land. It was a kind of ideal boundary of what the promised land was hoped to be. And beyond that, things weren't so good. Wilcox says, for much of Bible history, the threat of destruction had come chiefly from the region of the Euphrates and Tigris. Threatening things come from there. The Assyrians came from there, then the Babylonians, and in Roman times, the Parthians were there. A threat. Now these four angels are released from that place to do their destructive work. All this picture language. But see once again how God allows this. But it is the demons who act. That's complicated to get your head round. The sovereignty of God overruling in his mighty wisdom, deep wisdom, even the evil of his demons to work out his purposes. And what is that purpose? It's a horrible one. It is to kill a third of mankind. Verse 15, if you have it in front of you there, which is good to do. To kill a third of mankind. That's stark. Still partial. It's a third. But for these unbelieving people, for we take it that this is also a judgment on those who do not have the seal of God on them, the inhabitants of the earth, the woe comes on. There's a finality to this. Judgment, as it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. It's a finality to death. Now, it's not, of course, that believers in Christ do not die, although this judgment is focused on unbelievers. Believers do die. We know they do in all kinds of ways. Not exempt from that. But for them, death has lost its sting. When we die, we go to be with the Lord forever. Focus here on this judgment is on unbelievers. There's a remarkably precise description of the timing of this judgment. Look at verse 15, if you have it in front of you there. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. This very hour and day and month and year is unique in, its, in, a biblical, in terms of biblical descriptions of timings. Whenever this is, it is very specific. It speaks of God's sovereignty over all things, including the timing of death. That verse in Hebrews says that we are destined to die once. I'm hearing John's vision is God bringing that about for those involved in this judgment. I'm reminded that Jesus spoke of the day and the hour. Remember he said, no one knows about that day and hour. He's speaking about when he comes back again except the Father. That will be a one-off event, that day and hour. And that could suggest that what has been described here in Revelation is a one-off major event near the time of Jesus coming. It can't be the final judgment because it's only a third who are involved. It's partial, and the seventh trumpet brings a final judgment. We can't be sure. It might be that. See, it's difficult to interpret this. We've got to take the imagery, let it speak to us. What we can be sure of is that the precise timing of this judgment, whenever it happens, is in God's perfect hands. We talk about the President of the United States of America having his hand on the nuclear button, don't we, in that can give us concern in light of all that's happening at the moment. But to know that it is God who is sovereign over all things, He has His hand in everything, gives us great comfort that God is working out His purposes as a sovereign God He is in the depths of His wisdom, justice, and mercy. The vision moves from the four angels to a huge number of mounted troops jumps like that. So, presumably the angels are the leaders and these troops of mounted horsemen, demonic horsemen, are doing the work, this cavalry. It is massive. The previous NIV before 2011 had 
200 million, which was easy to understand. The new one translated, translates the Greek literally, twice 10,000 times 10,000. Can you work that out? Twice 10,000, that's 20,000. Times 10,000, what is it? Fair enough, 200 million. It's a precise sum. And John says, I heard their number. You couldn't count them, you had to be told. Here's what Michael Wilcox says again. The angels who will bring the destruction are unleashed at God's command at a zero hour of God's planning and with forces of God's numbering. Every single death they bring about will happen exactly as and when God plans it. However, this death comes in this vision of judgment. We're not told how. We can perhaps let our minds imagine what that might be. Across a wide range of circumstances, perhaps. War, conquest, famine, disease, disasters. Any kind of destructive action on any scale, whatever it might be. So think of examples of all the things that happen that we know of in the world. And multiply that. However it comes, it's within God's sovereign purpose and timing. Clear from what we read here. The sixth trumpet sounds the severest imaginable warning, this judgment of death, this large-scale bereavement, because that's what it would be, and that's what it is. That's the first heading. Next, the deception of demons. You couldn't say they're cheery uh, headings today, but that's not the point. Uh, it's got to be true to what's being said here. The deception of demons. With the fifth trumpet, we uh, were told what the nature of the judgment was. Then we had a very detailed description, description of this army of locusts, remember? Human faces, women's hair, lion's teeth, and all the rest of it. So here in the sixth trumpet, we are now we are given a very detailed description of the demonic cavalry. And note what John says in verse 17, the horses and riders, I saw in my vision look like this. He's, re he's deliberately reminding us that this is a vision. We respond accordingly and we interpret it accordingly. The rider's breastplates, are, we're told, are colored fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. It's our color scheme, but it means something. It's a depiction of judgment in itself. Fire, smoke, dark blue, I understand is a color of uh, sulfur when it burns, smoke, and sulfur or brimstone. Brimstone brings to mind judgment, doesn't it? Because sulfur itself appears in the description of hell later in Revelation, the lake of burning sulfur. So we have fiery red, dark blue like smoke, yellow like sulfur. Judgment on these breastplates. The horses' heads are like lions' heads, powerful, destructive. Out of their mouths come fire, smoke, and sulfur, tying in with the color of the breastplates. And it is, John says, by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur coming from the mouth of these horses that a third of mankind is killed. However, that actually happens. And similar to the locusts and trumpet five, the horses are lethal at both ends. Remember, this is a vision. The locusts had scorpion stings in their tails. These horses have tails like venomous snakes even more lethal. So we've got lion-like heads, and we've got snake-like tails. The devil's described as a roaring lion, isn't he? Comes full front in full frontal attack against us. He's also described as a serpent who comes hissing and deceptively to capture us. There you have it in these pictures, the devil here. The power of the devil in all is evil, deception, destruction, 
but it is being used with great precision by the sovereign Lord himself in this specific judgment for his own purposes. Verse 18 tells us that a third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of the horse's mouths. The horse's mouths. The fact that it is from the mouths of the horses means that speech, communication, what is being said, taught, heard, is a significant part of what is going on here. Like in the vision of Christ, the sword comes out of his mouth. It's his word that does the work. Well, here, a large part of what the devil is doing comes from what he says. Unbelievers are taken in and led astray. Here, as part of this judgment with disastrous consequences, death, taken in, deceived by what the devil says. Think of what happened to Eve in the garden when the serpent spoke to her. Derek Newton says, demons, listen carefully to this, demons intensify the doctrinal and moral deception and delusion of the ungodly in verses 17 to 19. False teaching abounds throughout the church age. Demons intensify the doctrinal and moral deception and delusion of the ungodly. We see that happening in our day. People are taken in to their great detriment by false teaching, deception, passing fashions of thought, lies, bad advice, ungodly direction, online gurus and influencers, whoever they may be, however it comes, the devil speaks and leads people astray in their sinfulness to destruction. It can seem at the moment that the whole center of gravity of our society is in danger of being loosed from God's ways, doesn't it? It can feel that way. Proverbs says, there is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. Someone has said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in everything. Completely prone to being taken astray. And just to make this practical, relevant, and indeed deliberately controversial in a sense. Here are some areas where as a society, I believe we see the influence of falsehood in communication. Gender ideology and the massive influence of LGBT teaching. The shaping and confirmation of culture by the media. The push for slackened abortion laws the push for euthanasia, the proposed conversion therapy ban, exaggeration of communication of threats to get people to do what those who are communicating it want, the use of fear to shape society, false and incomplete teaching in the church locally and nationally just some examples. You might think of others. We've got to be aware of it, folks, haven't we? <laughs> Otherwise, we'll just be as prone to, to it as the unbelievers that are being referred to here. How critically important is sound Bible teaching and Bible engagement in our day? We might think that we need to water that down in our day because the numbers are going down. We need to make it easier so that people can come in no! The sound teaching is even more important as society twists away from God's purposes and truth. We need clear, consistent, courageous, prophetic, faithful, applied teaching and preaching of God's Word more than ever. We must pray for ministers and other church leaders to be faithful, holy, with integrity of speech and life, all one together. And as believers in Christ, we all need to heed 
the challenge here of the deadly impact of demonic communication. In the Explore Bible reading notes I use, we're looking at Ezekiel at the moment, Ezekiel 12 and 13 are to do with false teaching, very relevant to this. People saying what people want them to say, what they want to hear. And the question was asked, this question was asked, which I found personally challenging, so I thought I would ask you it too. Here it is. What are the areas and repeated actions in your life where you'd like to hear someone say, God doesn't really mind about that, or let's not be negative, it's a normal part of life? How would you answer? You did time to think about that. But you see what the question is asking. Where do you want someone to say, it's okay, just carry on doing that? even though you don't think it's right. Then the note said, these are the areas where you're most susceptible to false teaching. That's powerful. These are the areas you're most susceptible to false teaching because you want it to be that. You see? In the light of John's vision here, we must pray for those around us uh, who are not believers in our families, among our friends, in our town, district, to be rescued from believing lies about God and the way things are, and to turn to Jesus as the, the, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to pray for ourselves to hold to that truth as well. Judgment of death, the deception of demons, then lastly, the failure to repent. And this is really the focus of this trumpet, becoming verses 20 and 21, to the emphasis of a really important emphasis of it. These verses make it clear that the aim of these partial judgments and all their severity to bring people back to God, tragically, doesn't work, doesn't happen. There is no repentance. Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. So they're seeing the reality of God's judgment. And they just carry on as they are doing. Don't turn away from the work of their hands. That's the way they're living without reference to God. Doing their own thing, going their own way, as Frank Sinatra sings, I did it my way. And I'll keep on doing it my way. We're told they don't stop worshiping. That must be a good thing, surely. They're spiritual, they're religious, they're worshiping. But look what they are worshiping. Demons and idols, the two are closely connected. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 that although an idol is nothing at all, when you worship an idol, you're actually worshiping the demon behind it, a demon behind it. Bob Dylan sang, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. We're made to worship, so we're going to worship something or somebody. So we turn away from God will worship someone or something else. It's really instructive how idols are described here. Their materials are listed. Gold, silver, bronze, stone, wood. They might be beautiful. They might be valuable. They might be impressive or attractive. But basically, they're just stuff, created stuff. Gold, silver, wood. They're just things. So their materials and then their inability to do anything is mocked. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't walk, they're impotent, they're useless. How foolish to worship such a thing. It's not just that they're not God, they're not anything. And that also applies with variation to other idols that people have, including activities people, whatever it might be. They might be able to speak, see, hear, and so on, if they're human. But they still can't deliver on the promise of being God because they're not God. They're still created. 
They cannot come through with what only God can do. It is foolish to worship anything or anyone other than God, isn't it? It's so obvious when I say that. But we do. People do. So we see in idolatry the blinding and binding and ultimately dehumanizing and devastating impact of the powerful delusion of the devil, idolatry. As Christians, we grieve for it, don't we? Sam Lee at the prayer meeting on Thursday quoted John Piper, an excellent thing that John Piper said. Missions exist because worship doesn't. We want to long to see people worshiping true and living God. Therefore, we go and tell them about Jesus. Sam Lee's our mission partner. who's at the prayer meeting on Zoom. So we can see that in other people's lives, but we also need to hear as Christians a challenge about idols in our own lives. Do you or I need to repent of idolatry? Derek Newton gives a helpful list for us to ponder, and this again also is deliberately controversial in the sense that it's meant to challenge us. Listen to this. Idolatry can certainly extend to career, family obsession, leisure, holiday travel, promotion, material greed, self-absorption, pornography, money, safety in the world, comfort, material possessions, worldly security, and more. Does that challenge you? It challenges me. Idolatry, we must be aware of it. It's also a ledge from which we dive off into all other sins. So John ends by saying that the surviving two-thirds didn't repent of their sins either, and he lists murders, witchcraft, sexual immorality, thefts. If you add up all the different uh, sins here and things that John describes, I make it six or seven of the Ten Commandments are broken. You might want to look at that next to 20 yourself and see if you agree. It's so tragic here, this failure to repent and turn to God, isn't it? Given the lengths that God is going to to achieve that end. The warning, it seems, has been in vain. The seventh trumpet will soon sound heralding final judgment. For now there is still time. This is the day of grace. So let me return to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, I quoted earlier, adding in now verse 28 for completeness. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So may many respond in our day to Jesus in repentance and faith before it is too late. May that be our prayer and our motivation in response to what we've heard today. May God bless his word to our hearts. I'm going to sing now, all I once held dear, built my life upon. Stand to sing. And
Let us come to God now with our prayers of thanksgiving and for others. Lord God, our Father, we have heard your solemn word to us today of how you are working out your purposes in history, acting in accordance with your justice and mercy. You direct all things, even suffering and death itself causing the wrath of men to praise you. You're doing all this to achieve your will. You're the sovereign and gracious Lord, and we bow in awe before you. May we respond to your word the way you intend. Please bring many around us who do not live for you to be stopped short by the reality of what this world is like and by who you are and what you do, and be brought by your grace to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, your Son. And for ourselves who trust in your Son, may our lives reflect him more and more, 
May we be faithful to you and your truth, holding fast only to you, worshiping only you, keeping our lives from idols. May we be empowered by your love to reach out to others with the good news of Jesus. Lord God, we pray today for Jewish people everywhere. Holocaust Memorial Day yesterday prompts us to remember with them the horrors of what happened to so many millions of Jews during World War II at the hands of evil men. Have mercy in this people who still have a special place in your purposes. Please watch over and protect them and direct them in your right ways. And as the Apostle Paul prayed for his own people to be saved through trusting in Jesus Christ, your Son, we too pray for many Jewish people throughout the world to turn to Jesus as Messiah for their salvation and blessing, for the great enrichment of your church, and for your glory. As we think, Father, of the conflict in Israel, we ask for justice and peace there. And in your mercy, may help and deliverance get to those who need it, those who are suffering. We think, too, of what is happening in the Red Sea area with Yemen's attacks in southern Israel and shipping. Think of Kathy Anderson's grandson, Blair, who is on a ship there, we understand, in that region. Remember other wars and conflicts as well, in particular Russia, Ukraine conflict, asking for an end to that in your mercy. We know, Lord Jesus, you said that wars and rumors of wars will be happening, and we hear those things just now. In and through all this, Lord, we know from your word in Revelation that you're working out your purposes of judgment and mercy and acting for the sake of those who trust in and will come to trust in your Son. May your will be done indeed, Lord. Lord God our Father, we bring you our offerings which you have put in the plate or made through the bank. Take and use them for your glory in the extension of your kingdom, the growth of your church, and your work in the world. And today we give you thanks for the service given over many years by Ron Smith as treasurer, and ask your blessing on Andy Mabry taking over. May you give him the strength, skill, wisdom, and time for this responsibility in your service. Father, we continue to pray for those who are unwell in body or mind those who are going through tests, treatment, or surgery, remembering to their families. May they trust in you and know you hold them fast. Particularly today, we pray for our elder, Mary Walker, as she has become treatment. Please bring her safely through that, and may it be effective. And be with Ashley, who's normally here at the front with us, with his uh, breathing difficulties. May your healing hand be on him. And for others known to us, we bring them to you. And we ask for your comfort for all who grieve the death of a loved one. May they know your comfort, strength, and the hope of the gospel. And now, Father, in a moment of quiet, we bring our personal concerns to you. Lord, hear all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, as we bring them in the name of Jesus. Amen. As a reminder, if you wish prayer after the service, just come over to the organ here. Crown him with many crowns is our closing hymn. Let's sing this together.
go now in peace to love, worship, and serve the Lord. Now let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.